Fira Health is a mental health facility in downtown Bellevue that specializes in partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient programs for women, girls, and female aligned individuals. Fira's treatment programs are grounded in dialectical behavior therapy, which is a well-researched and highly effective treatment for those who are at a high risk of suicide, engage in self-harm, or suffer from other complex problems such as eating disorders, anxiety, depression, and more. For more information about Thera Health and its treatment options, please visit www.therahealth.com. A few bookkeeping notes. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Thera Health website in a few days. You'll receive an email when it is available. During the presentation, all audience microphones will be muted and cameras will be turned off. At the conclusion of the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your question. You may submit questions at any time, but all will be held until the end of the presentation. We will try to answer as many as we can in the time allotted. If you enjoy this webinar, Thera will be conducting another one on Wednesday, December 8th, titled Healing for the Holidays, Grieving During the Season of Celebration. More information and registration details will be sent to you shortly. Thank you again for your interest in today's presentation. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Burns. So nice to have everyone here tonight. I really appreciate you're all making an effort to be here in our already dark and gloomy days of winter. I think it's really apropos to be talking about this now as we approach the holidays, as the kids are somewhat settled into a school year that somewhat feels more normal, at least more so than it did last year. But I know it's come at quite a cost. I know everyone comes to this, not just this moment here, but this year with a lot of exhaustion and depletion. So my hope for today is to really invigorate folks and make folks feel that they have a sense of hope and maybe some empowerment and knowledge about how to best support their kiddos around some really difficult times. So my background, um, as David mentioned, is in women's mental health. So I did my fellowship training at the Brigham and really came to navigate my way to an appreciation, a very profound appreciation of the mind-body connection and of the impact that hormones and biologic changes, how, how intensely they can impact our mood state. And working here at Thera, I've developed and cultivated an even greater appreciation of how powerful our minds are in being able to shape our response to stress, to trauma, and how capable we are of finding resilience in spite of everything that's around us. So for today, I'm hoping that we'll be able to, as a group, come to learn to understand the effects that hormones have on us as humans, particularly on our, our little growing humans uh, and on their changing bodies and brains, as well as the relationship between hormones, stress, and anxiety. And then really from there, moving into a place where we can talk about the steps to support our kiddos, to help them get through these times uh, in which they're struggling not only in the world, but in their brains and in their bodies. So... What happens, what happens during puberty? I think that a lot of us, a lot of the participants tonight, myself included, are fairly far from puberty, I imagine. Um, many of you have kiddos that are just kind of bumping up against the cusp of it. They're in their tweens or their teens. Some of you might have older kids that have already passed through puberty, you know, more power to you. Kudos, you've made it through one. But, you know, with each kiddo, you know, with each life, it's so different. So what's happening? What underlies all of the the chaos and the confusion that these kiddos experience that we also once experienced too. So the first thing that I always like to think about is, again, emphasizing the headphones connected to the body, right? And even though a lot of the manifestations of what's happening in puberty, not just the external manifestations, the pimples, the facial hair, the awkwardness, the changes in voice, she changes the body shape, not all of those external appearances, but the, really the emotional changes that are happening, the cognitive growth, the exponential cognitive and emotional growth that's happening, you know, are really, it's all connected. And I think the, that really understanding the underpinnings of that connection is impossible. And that all goes back to something called the HPA axis. Not on this slide, but it's the idea that the brain, the higher orders of thinking in our brain and our cortex are connected to the hypothalamus, which is then connected to our pituitary gland and connected to glands all throughout the body that modulate and maintain homeostasis. They keep us in balance, not just physical balance, but emotional balance. And really, at this 
beauty of this is the adrenals. The adrenals kind of nestle right up against our kidneys, so we have two of them, and they modulate so much that's needed to just maintain our ability to take breaths, for a heart to beat, for us to do everything that we need to do to stay alive. So in a very basic way, in a very primitive way, we need our adrenal glands. What happens before a kiddos even begin to think about, you know, facial hair and training bras and periods and all of that is a period of time called adrenergy. And this idea is that it's, it's the awakening of the adrenal glands. So it's the adrenal glands coming online. And I'm sure many of you can, you know, surmise, like, the adrenal glands secrete adrenaline. And what do we know about adrenaline? Adrenaline fuels so much in the way of powerful reactions, powerful experiences of things. They, they allow us to flee from a tiger in the jungle. They allow us to dodge a bus as we're trying to cross northeast states. So they are so essential. And as those glands come online for the first time in a new human, in a human that's just six to eight years old that's had no other life experiences and not a lot of opportunities to kind of strategize and cultivate coping skills, it can look kind of messy. So, you know, this next slide, I think, is um, really, actually, I'll flip forward a couple because I think it's just so telling. <laughs> it's really speaks to me. I have a seven-year-old, so I'm a little ways out from true puberty, but I can honestly say that, you know, there is nothing more really poignant to, the, to these two photos for me than understanding kind of when a kiddo is navigating, whether it's adrenarchy and the adrenals coming online or puberty or menarche, the first time a cis woman gets her period. You know, these are all things that come with such mystery and confusion to a kiddo experiencing it for the first time. And many adults still aren't entirely in touch with their body and our bodily sensations and how they're connected to our emotions. So imagine being a six-year-old trying to navigate this and understanding why do I also have this surge of energy and this need to want to jump on someone. I mean, case in point, that's my seven-year-old when I come home most nights. It's that really sweet look scampering down the hall that all of a sudden turns into a bear hug. And, you know, a headlock, really, I'll be honest with you. So I think it's really important to acknowledge how profound that is. And our kids are experiencing it, and they have no idea what it really means. But our adrenals are essential. They help us breathe. They help us. They help us perfuse all of our bodily organs. And again, as I said before, they keep us safe from danger in a lot of ways. So what are we kind of thinking about as we're starting to kind of watch our kiddos going through these big emotions, these big ups and downs that can occur, not just, you know, as we're colloquially thinking about puberty and menstrual cycles across the course of a month, but even across the course of a day. I mean, I think we can all think back to a, a time when we all experienced the witching hour. I mean, to be honest, I think I still have it right now. I also have puppies, so witching hour is a real legit thing right now in our household. And there's a reason for that. Sure, it's fatigue and the toll of the day and being hangry, all of those things. But our hormones fluctuate in patterns across the course of the day, these diurnal patterns that also underscore some of these fluctuations and emotions that we see. So, in addition to the adrenals, right, so we're starting at kind of a basic level. We all have our adrenal glands. We all need them in order to survive on a very primitive level, right? But then you get to this higher order of complexity as kids start to mature, as they start to bring other systems online, particularly the reproductive systems. So, sex hormones start to allow for physical maturation, either masculinization or feminization, as well as the ability to kind of proliferate the species and procreate. So, super necessary. And, you know, considering also that there's a lot of cognitive, social, emotional maturation that happens during these times, too, really essential for the good of all. However, they come with a lot of very unsettling experiences for kids. So, you know, the, what's coming with the adrenals coming online when kids are like eight kind of continues all throughout the teens. And then really even into the 20s, we're starting to see sort of the echoes and the reverberations of puberty. So thinking about cis women, this is, you know, I work primarily with folks who are female identifying and female aligned. So that might be trans or cis women. But thinking about those who are born with two X chromosomes and a pair of ovaries, um, you know, hormonal fluctuations start to happen anywhere between 9 and 13 to 15 in relation to 
reproduction, right? So over the course of the month, estrogen and progesterone fluctuate in order to make a lot of different functions happen that are, again, essential for maintaining the species. Um, but these fluctuations can, of course, have a huge impact on mood and anxiety states. So what we know about estrogen and progesterone, and some of you are familiar with them, some of you might have experiences with them in relation to oral contraceptives, in relation to pregnancy, in relation to menopause. All of these things rely on fluctuations, changing levels of both estrogen and progesterone. So no hormone, as we'll talk more about later, no hormone in the body is going to maintain at a static level. Because homeostasis, the ability for a body to maintain balance, requires agility. And in order for that to happen, in order for, in order for us to flex in a moment's notice, hormone levels have to fluctuate too. And there's actually a lot of help and a lot of resilience and wellness that come from that ability to fluctuate flex. So over the course of a month, a woman's, a woman's cycle will vary in terms of where estrogen levels are and where progesterone levels are. Typically speaking, there's sort of this, this midpoint across the course of a month in which ovulation happens. And that is marked by changes in both estrogen, estrogen levels starting to drop off, and progesterone levels starting to rise. Progest, progesterone, pro pregnancy. So, this is the idea of the body kind of being in two different states across the course of a month, preparing to ovulate and preparing for that egg to be fertilized into a plant. So, all of these things are happening. And what, what's coming with them is the, the secondary sequela of what estrogen and progesterone do. What we've learned and what we know from you know decades and decades of research, empirical awareness, is that. Declining levels of estrogen, and again, this can be over the course of a month, over the course of a lifetime, after a pregnancy, in many different kind of settings, many different sort of subsets, declining levels of estrogen are correlated to declining mood, so depression. And declining levels of progesterone, so when an egg is not fertilized and does not implant, progesterone levels start to die off and fall. And with that comes an increased vulnerability or increased risk of anxiety and agitation and irritability. And then what happens? And then it's right? And we start all over again. Literally, all over again. So thinking about not just cis women that are going through these changes, trans women, Young, young kiddos, kiddos young, young boys, boys, all sorts of, of we're talking about, about all over the gender spectrum, spectrum. Hormonal, hormonal changes are happening regardless of what chromosomes you have and what sex organs you report with. But, but the, the idea is that, you know, many people can manage this. Many, many people do fine. And many of you can reflect back and say, like, yeah, you know, there were times that were hard, but it was okay. But for some people, there's an increased vulnerability there. And, and these are the same people that might have, you know, again, that two hit hypothesis, right? There's a genetic predisposition. Maybe there's some environmental impacts. But the idea is that some people, as with anything, are going to be more vulnerable, vulnerable, more susceptible than others to sort of these negative sequelae that we see. So, yes, puberty, never easy, per se. Each person's experience of it can vary drastically. But the trick to think about, too, with these kiddos in this window of time, and again, this is meant to really validate your experience as parents, who probably are, to say the least, I think it would be a euphemism to say you're tired, maybe? Tired, right? I think that's an understatement of gargantuan proportions. But you really layer on the past year and a half and think of the impact that has had when we consider emotional development, social-emotional learning, friendships, relationships, family life, all of these things are so much more stressed. So these kiddos at this vulnerable window of time now have this to contend with. It's so hard, which means it's really hard for you, which means you need a village and you're definitely not alone. So, everyone, I'll just skip over that. Um, so, you know, what did this mean? What did this mean for our kiddos across the past year and a half? Many of you know and have seen it firsthand, the impact of what it meant to be at home, right? On all of us, holy cow. The impact on a parent to be all of a sudden wearing how many different hats? You were the teacher, you're the parent, you're the meal monitor, you're the disciplinarian, you are the PE coach, you're the soccer coach, you're doing it all. 
and that it's exhausting. And, and sometimes, sometimes you also have to be the friend because your kid is at home and they're not able to actually engage with their friends in any kind of IRL way, right? I don't think any of us should have to rely on TikTok to be a friend. And I think a lot of our kids have just out of necessity. So the social isolation, the inability to be able to connect in a real way with friends, the inability to be able to get that external validation from classmates, from teachers, has been remarkably difficult. I know that all of you, maybe many of you have worked from home. Many people's jobs have completely changed. Many people have had to stop working because of their kiddos not being able to go to school. And, you know, that's been something that my family has had to deal with, too. Being home, not being able to get that external validation that we're used to relying on from colleagues, from doing a good job, from serving the people that we work with and work for. It's been hard all around, and it's left everyone feeling, I think, rather depleted, and just without the skills that we would ordinarily have in other situations. So circling back around to kind of thinking about hormones. And, you know, the reason why I hit on this, not only because puberty is hard, but it's harder right now for a lot of reasons. And I think the takeaway that I want everyone to have, well, one of them is you're not alone, and this is really, really hard, and you're doing the best you can, and your kiddos are doing the best they can. But really just this idea that this is actually, albeit a terribly painful time, a time of so much growth and change. Kiddos in their tween and teen years, there's so much potential for capitalizing on that fluidity of mind, on that ability to really acquire new skills, to integrate new information. I mean, literally what's happening in the brain of these kiddos is all kinds of synaptic pruning, new connections are being made. There's the potential to truly cultivate an entirely new set of ways to cope, a new set of ways to manage and perceive stress. So I think as much as we are being tasked with the most daunting year and a half probably many of us have ever seen, it's an opportunity also to look at our kids and see, hey, here's also the potential to alight on this different path. And here's an opportunity to kind of push the pause button and say, okay, keeping in mind what's going on in their brain, all the rapid changes that are happening in growth, all the hormonal fluctuations that are happening in the midst of pandemic, that, that seems like a perfect storm, and it is, but it's also an opportunity to modulate. It's an opportunity to practice amidst the worst kind of stressor these kids may, I hope, ever see. So thinking about hormones, we talked about, again, the menstrual cycle, right? So in relation to cis women who, and trans women who are going to be taking exogenous hormones, there, there are going to be fluctuations across the month. And, and that can be met with, again, more vulnerability for depression, more vulnerability for anxiety and irritability. But in a broader picture, you know, hormones have roles across the board from our head to our toes, right? Hormones are chemical messengers. They're messengers that, send, that kind of signal input and output between our body and our brain. So they play a role in all kinds of processes that require feedback. They kind of work in these loops that are actually quite elegant in order to maintain, you know, our ability to grow, our ability to nurture ourselves, our ability to maintain, you know, thermal regulation, appetite cues, satiety cues, thirst, a drive to sleep, a drive for wakefulness, and, you know, in a really big way, our cognition, our memory, our ability to learn, as well as our emotions. So if we're talking about, you know, sex hormones, like estrogen and progesterone and testosterone, and that's one part of it. But the grand, in the grand scheme of things, we're also talking about the impact each of them have because they all intricately connect with one another. You know, thyroid function, pancreas, and insulin production, and the maintenance and balance of glucose regulation in our bodies. All of these things, in addition to the adrenals and the ovaries, all of these are going to play a part in that homeostatic balance. And the beauty of it is, even at my age, you know, all of this is kind of malleable. The beauty of it being something that we think about and consider at, at kids who are as young as, you know, 9, 13, 15, is that there is a, a, a potential to manifest and modulate, hold on to really lasting and profound change. 
So I kind of hit on this before, but obviously the, the, the range of hormones is very broad. It has to be because this is how our brain signals to our body, to all our vital organs. One of the places that I really like to emphasize in as a psychiatrist is someone dealing with depression, anxiety, and emotion dysregulation in patients every day is the idea of the fight or flight response. And I know many of you have heard of this, and nowadays it's more adapted to fight, flight, or freeze. And it's that survival mode. It's that survival mode that has been, from an evolutionary standpoint, bred into any surviving human and creature that says, if I sense danger or a threat, I need to act. And, and that, that means very quickly an automatic or autonomic response from our nervous system that allows us to manage, cope with, avoid, and engage with whatever threat is in the environment. So totally essential thing, right? Again, running across Northeast States and getting out of the way of the bus. Or, you know, I'm jogging in Tiger Mountain and, oh, hey, mountain lion, great. So all of these things require pupils to dilate so we can see and run far blood to perfuse our muscles so that we can run fast, our blood pressure to go up, our heart rate to go up, our ability to oxygenate everything in our body, all very essential and all needed and, you know, modulated by that fight or flight response. And that goes back to the adrenals, so our adrenal glands, adrenaline, right? And also to cortisol. Cortisol is another big player when we think about kind of long-term sequelae of stress. So, so there's this idea that, that yes, yes, we need that fight or flight response. We need, we need it to get out of danger. But the, the trick is, we don't need it to stay on forever. So really the trick, that, or the thing that we have to keep in mind is that we all need to be, again, agile. We all need to be responsive. Things do need to fluctuate in our brains and our bodies. But the fact that in some of us, particularly in those of us who are struggling with maybe, I don't know, a global pandemic, that fight or flight, that stress response, that worry about needing to stay safe and avoid danger is turned on. So there are circuits in our brain, there are fear circuits that involve several structures, including the hippocampus is where we store memories, the amygdala that modulates fear and anger, and in some of us, and we've seen this in folks who've been subjected to either big T or little T trauma, we can look at functional imaging, so PET scans, functional MRIs, and we can see that even in times of peace and calm, even if the person would subjectively say, I'm at peace, people that have had this activated and heightened stress response on their MRI or their PET scan, you can see activity still in that circuit. So not only is it that they actually really aren't calm, you know, they may feel they are, just it's all relative. But honestly, the amount of glucose, the amount of energy, of ATP that's needed to manifest that persistent stress response is significant, which is why when we're stressed out, we're so tired. It's actually depleting. As much as it's going to take energy for me to run down the block, it's going to take energy for me to manifest worry about what might happen when I run down the block. So I think that the really important thing to keep in mind is just the idea that we don't want that fight or flight response to stick around. We don't want it to be this all or none period. We want to be flexible and we want our kids to have that as well. So what is it? What happens? What happens if we're staying in this fear response for too long? What's too long? Well, longer than it takes for the, you know, the mountain lines to run back up the hill, longer than it takes for the bus to blow by. So, so really our heart rate, our blood pressure, our worry, those racing thoughts should all dial back down once the threat, once the perceived threat or danger passes. And I think all of you can kind of say, yeah, there have been times where that's not happened for me, where those ruminative worries and thoughts stick around. And I think the trick is right now understanding how prominent this is in our kiddos. As much as we can protect them and try to shelter them, no one is really immune from from the impact of the past year and a half, from the impact of wearing a mask. Oh, you can't actually go to your friend's house. Oh, you have to stay stand six feet apart. You can't actually be in school. No, we can't go there because of danger, because of risk. So in very subtle ways that it's accumulated, there are a lot, there's a lot of messaging out there about fear and about the need to be vigilant. And it's essential, right? We've had to do all of these things to stay to stay healthy. We've had to maintain social distancing. We've had to maintain quarantines when they're needed. And masking. Let's maintain the masking. But, you know, it's really a matter of what that's doing kind of subconsciously, what that's doing to our nervous systems.
in a, in a way, way that none, none of us intended, and certainly, certainly not something that we intended for our kiddos. So, so this sort of persistent stress response, excuse me, persistent or stress response leads to the depletion, right? It's taking actual glucose, taking calories to manifest, and that's going to predispose and set up and make vulnerable anyone for anxiety, for depression, even when there wasn't a history there before. So our kiddos are already vulnerable because of the hormonal fluctuations that are happening. Now they're in a pandemic where they're dealing with stressors that are causing this depletion. So it's really a time when we need to be the ones that are asking questions that are uncomfortable and awkward because it's important for us to relay to them that, you know, we need to talk about this because we're doing everything we can to keep each other safe. And the viability of maintaining the stress, the stress response, the necessity of it just isn't there because what it's doing is it's just depleting us further. So, you know, I can imagine, as many of you have, you know, I have a, a, a seven-year-old who will be getting his first vaccination on Thursday. I'm very excited about that. But I think in a lot of ways, there haven't been many opportunities over the past year and a half to feel helpful or empowered in any way because there's so much that we don't know there's, there's so many things that we do our best around, but, you know, we can't do anything perfect right now because there's so much that's unknown. So that for us, I know, is exhausting. It's anxiety provoking. And I think the same echoes and reverberates for our kiddos, too. So I think the trick is, what do we do with all of this, right? The, the takeaway is not for anyone to feel like, oh, my God. But a kid that's lived through the pandemic, what, what can I do? But there's so much that we can do again because this is this valuable window of time where we can teach and cultivate this ability to tolerate distress and this ability to modulate emotions and understand where they're coming from. So I think that it is about starting to have those conversations, hard, awkward conversations about their bodies, about what's changing in their bodies. One, One of the things that, that you know, I really like to do is just kind of talking about, and with some kids it's drawing, some kids it's story, some kids it's play. For me, the most effective way to talk to my kiddos is move on a fight fight. And he's ahead of me and I'm behind him and he kind of yells back at me because it feels safe, you know, and it's authentic, but it's, it's safe, right? And each of you are going to find your own way, hopefully, to be able to talk to your kids about these things. Because ask a 13-year-old, you know, how they're feeling about hormones, crickets, right? And many kids aren't going to want to talk about it. So I think the trick is finding a way, finding a way for that opening to happen. Sometimes even using narratives about, hey, you know, when I was your age, I can't remember this happened, and I remember it was just so hard, and then I realized that part of why it was so hard was because I was about to get period. All of these sorts of narratives and these stories can be, uh, they'll receive an eye roll, of course, at first pass. But with time, honestly, sometimes it will settle in. And I think it's just the repetition and the courage to really just keep going, to keep trying. I think that one of the reasons, you know, again, emphasizing this just because these are pre-pandemic numbers, 7% of kids having anxiety, 3% having depression. I have to tell you, we don't have new numbers from the WHO, but they're going to be higher than that. And you all see that in your homes, in your schools, on your soccer teams. It's there. And, you know, I think the trick is that, you know, there are fewer resources. I know that wait times to get in with psychologists, even pediatricians, little psychiatrists, and more subspecialized folks, they're drastically long. And that's because everything in our system is so overtaxed. So none of us is really at an advantage in that sense. And I think that's why it is important to feel, again, you're not alone. And we want to be here to help. One of the ways that I really um, appreciate, you know, my time here at Fira is really learning to kind of take so take away um, so much strength from this idea of the dialectic, right? So this slide just talks about something many of you probably already obviously know, the idea that no one can kind of snap out of a mood state that's biologically based. No one can really will their way out of the impact that hormonal fluctuations are going to have on their mood. And, you know, if we, would, if we could, we would. I know for sure. I mean, any of you that have experienced pregnancy or postpartum or menopause, like, it's easier said than done. And I think there are times when I can definitely feel myself wanting to say to my kiddo, like, oh, buddy, there's so much worse things. Or, oh, buddy, like, come on, let's move on. And really recognizing, like, 
the fact if I said that to myself, if, I, if someone said that to me, and an understanding, this repetition, because all of it is repetition, that like, it's this dialectic. It's a dialectic between acceptance and change. And I have the privilege of working with Dr. Katie Forslund here at Vera Health, who was one of the disciples and researcher extraordinaire who worked alongside Marshall Linehan in developing a DBT protocol and understanding applications of DBT. And so I feel very lucky to, to have this wealth of knowledge here and this idea it just, just pervades kind of my senses now, this idea that there are things that might be opposing in, you know, obvious sense, but that they, they coexist, right? That we need to be able to accept what we see, that my child is throwing a tantrum because the Lego piece isn't the right size and it's not fitting and it's into the world, right? And they become a human as dispenser of emotions. But the idea is that the acceptance has to come first, the validation has to come, and then what can come with that, secondary to it at the same time, is change. So it's these two polar kind of sides of things that we have to keep in mind, that acceptance is happening while change needs to happen as well. And acceptance in a non-judging way, acceptance in a, I might not love it, I might not love that I'm dealing with this stress, I might not love that I feel so anxious and fearful, I might not love that, you know, I'm about to get my period. I'm so irritable. But I have to accept that that's where I'm at right now. And then what can I do to tolerate it? What can I do to manage it? What can I do to cope with it effectively? So that's where the change piece comes in. So the idea is we have a lot of power. As much as we have power over the idea of, you know, hey, if I'm anxious, I'm probably going to get a stomach ache, right? The mind-body connection is really profound. We have the ability to modulate some of these thoughts, to modulate some of these emotions as well. So again, I mentioned the idea of validating. Validating and accepting where someone is at in a given moment. Because all of our kiddos are going to be at a place of the human pest dispenser of emotions where everything is the worst possible thing. Every minute of the day is the worst possible day and so it's not. And I think what I've learned is that trying to challenge in that moment when that kiddo is not in wise mind, whether it's my seven-year-old or one of the teens I'm working with, when they're in that sort of primitive, fight or flight, anxious, heightened state, they're not going to hear anything I'm saying. They're certainly not going to want a suggestion. They're not going to want to problem solve. They're going to want some validation of what they're feeling. And even if I don't agree with them, even if I want to say, like, this is a first world problem, your Lego, it's, it's not a big deal, but... I know they're not going to hear that. And what they're going to hear is me bending down, reaching down, and offering a hug. And validating that you seem so frustrated. I'm so sorry. I know you're so disappointed. What can we do to figure this out? And I know that that's hard. And for me, it's a lot of practice and repetition. But again, even at my age, even at 44, I learned something new. So it's possible. It's certainly possible for kiddos, too. Because they have that capacity to change beyond what we ordinarily expect of them, really. So when you're thinking about these kiddos that you have at home that are struggling with these big emotions, that are navigating the hormonal changes of puberty, that are navigating the persistent stress of the pandemic, what do you do with that, right? So in addition to trying and modeling and maybe doing some like role play around the acceptance and the validation before the change, I think it's reaching out and making sure you've had a second set of eyes from your pediatrician to determine, like, is this is this normative, right? And there are going to be cases where your pediatrician might say, like, well, this is kind of beyond what we would expect in terms of a basic hormonal fluctuation. Maybe we want to consult about a hormonal intervention to help balance things out. Maybe we want to consult the psychiatrist about some medication choices to help support things a little bit more. So I think it's the idea of not worrying alone, never worry alone, right? Obviously, you're not alone. There's a village of you out there, of us out there, who are struggling with this and doing our best to kind of support our kiddos. But that's what our providers are there for. That's what the pediatricians are there for. So I think finding, finding that network and kind of tapping in, into it to the best of your ability, knowing that sometimes the resources will be limited, they may then suggest a bunch of things. Anything from DBT, which I love, to supportive therapy, 
mindfulness exercises, holistic supplements. One of the things we were thinking about hormones, the one thing that I, you know, the takeaway I'd love for you to have is patterns, looking for patterns. Whether we're talking about the course of a day, and it's like, oh, it's 6 p.m. every day that this happens. Noticing those patterns, whether it's the course of a day or a course of the month. There's a period tracking app that I love. I mean, I love a good paper calendar, right? Who doesn't? But there's a period tracking app called Blue that allows you to set and toggle through different things from mood and anxiety, irritability, sleep, kind of physical stuff alongside like a calendar. So you can really start to see patterns because data collection is empowering. Kato is being able to, with you, with your support, recognize patterns in their emotional states is incredibly empowering. And then you being able to tie it back to, like, okay, like, I know you're doing your best. This is because X, Y, and Z are happening in your body. That's normative, and it sucks, right? There's that acceptance and kind of validation that, yeah, it's not fun, but it's, it's part of the normal development that you're going you're gonna to be experiencing. And we'll work together to figure out a way to navigate it so you get some comfort, really. And I think that's the trick. None of us, your kids, you, me, none of us should be left suffering alone. It's just not feasible anymore. People are far too depleted to be doing that. And I think there are too many wonderful, creative kiddos and parents out there that need to spend their time giving back to the world and doing all the great things and creating all the wonderful things he can and not being mired and feeling alone and worrying alone about some of these things. So these are just a bunch of really good resources that I would suggest kind of checking out, particularly to the Planned Parenthood site. Um, it's super great in terms of offering suggestions about how to talk to kids about hormones and puberty. I really love um, also the adolescent health site, too, that talks a little bit more about reproduction and kind of is informative for parents. Um, the other things that I just want to highlight are the Inger Health Center. We were talking about not binary folks, folks that are transitioning. Folks, folks that are still trying to figure, figure out their gender. The Inger Cell Center is a local resource, and they're amazing. I, you know, interface with them and work with them frequently when I'm trying to make sure that my patients have all the resources they need to better understand their gender, better understand the impact hormones are having on them. So this is a hopefully a, the beginning of a list that you can sort of start to be curious and be curious with your kids around. Um, but really, again, the takeaway is just that I want you all to know you're not alone. And, you know, as a parent, working my way, trudging my way through this, too, I think the biggest, biggest help and support is knowing that, you know, this is part of, this is part of our life right now. And the CVs are normative processes that, unfortunately, are causing us to all be really depleted and more vulnerable to doing that to our kids, too. So I think being kind to yourselves, being kind to your kids, offering yourself the same acceptance and validation that you're offering your kiddos. So I would love to answer questions with the time that we have left. David, I'm not sure if you do have questions or not, but I'm happy to answer them. And obviously, moving forward, I'm here at Thera, and I'm always happy to, to you know, to field questions in the future, here too. Thank you, Dr. Burns. That was fantastic. Um, as a reminder to everyone, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Just type in a question. We have uh, a few so far. Um, what considerations are there for kids who are non-binary or trans? I know you were touching on that a little bit, but maybe yeah. a little more detail. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's really important to keep in mind that, you know, you know even, even if hormones, hormones maybe it's several, several but, but the idea yeah. is even, even if hormones, hormones are exogenous, let's, let's say, let's say my kiddo is, you know, a trans woman and needs hormones to not only suppress testosterone levels, but also to offer feminization. Those exogenous, those external hormones are going to have an impact on mood and anxiety too. So having the right support and validation to say like, this is, this is hard. This is absolutely hard as well. But also keeping in mind that kiddos that are born in a body that just doesn't feel, that is not affirming, that is not fitting with their own gender identity it's incredibly hard it's incredibly hard and it under, underpins so much dysphoria so many body image issues a lot of disordered eating can result from it a lot of depression and even suicide so i think it really is important to make sure that those kiddos are getting the support that they need the anger cell center again is a really good resource Lambert House is another great resource for these kiddos. And I think it is just important to keep in mind that, you know, our hormonal fluctuations, we may not fit our gender, right? 
they may not fit what we perceive as being the right fitting gender for us which makes it twice as hard, and still they're going to happen, right? They're still going to happen, whether we have two X chromosomes or an X or a Y chromosome. It's just important to get that validating and affirming support. Great, thank you. We have another question from the audience. What type of oral contraceptives are helpful for a girl already on antidepressants who has strong anxiety and depression related to her period? Ooh, good. Ooh, yeah. That's a, that's a good, good one. one. That's, that's my real house. So, you know, I think really important history taking is needed. And hopefully you have a good pediatrician or maybe the psychiatrist is really well informed. But first the data collection, right? Because it is important to, and I've had patients like this, where when you collect enough data, you can see like, okay, yes, you do have depression and anxiety the whole month. It just intensifies in your medial phase. So those two, one to two weeks before your period, things get really real. And so it's important to recognize that. There are some patients that I've had that upon further reflection, it's like, actually, half the month is fine. It's just half the month is really bad. And it's a simple hormonal intervention, like an oral contraceptive, may actually do the trick. And one of the ones that is being studied and been recommended for PMS and also PMDD, which is a variant of PMS, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is when symptoms escalate to such an extent that functionality is impaired, suicidal ideation arises, and those are folks who can seem to benefit from Yaz or Yasmin. And, you know, typically the, the thing to remember, too, is really harm reduction. So there's not really a necessity to have a period every month. And there's some pediatricians that are going to diverge from me around this, but if someone is dealing with such a severe symptoms and they impact them every two weeks, my argument is, you know what, I would rather them function and have just a few periods a year and monitor growth curves than feel like the rug gets pulled out from under them and the whole world collapses for two weeks of the month. That's just not fair. So thinking about suppression, thinking about using a continuous oral contraceptive so that folks, again, can pick and choose when and if they have a period. And then there's also the recognition of like, hey, do we have a family history of an adverse response to hormones? And so that's important to keep in mind. Your family history is going to be super telling. And for some people, they'll say like, oh my gosh, yeah, my mom and my grandma and my aunt, like they can never take the pill. They can never tolerate hormones. That's really important data. And you tread lightly with that data. I think if you've had a kiddo who's maybe had an adverse reaction to a hormonal intervention, because sometimes it can go, you know, it can go two paths. It can be like, this fits it. This is great. I feel the support I need. And for some, those hormonal interventions can exacerbate symptoms. So it's important to tread lightly. It's important to collect all the data that you have about patterns of behavior and mood fluctuations, and also really consider the family history. But Yasmin, for a lot of these kiddos, and menstrual suppression at least three or four months at a time can offer a lot of relief. Great, thank you. Had a couple other questions come in. Um, I'll take them in order. Is there a difference in magnitude and duration of cortisol between a prepubescent and postpubescent individual? Ooh, that's a really good question and super interesting. And I could really geek out on this one, but I'm going to try not to. So um, we all have different levels of sort of variability. So cortisol is released in a pulsatile sort of fashion. And how frequently to what degree it's released is going to be based on a lot of things. And a lot of it is based on kind of a diurnal pattern, so what the pattern looks like over the course of the day, but also how we're genetically made up. We all come with our own set of blueprints, and we all come with our own set of exposures and environmental experiences, whether it's, you know, someone who maybe has been through three wars and never has even ever had a hair. And you might have the next person over that's actually had no big T or little T, meaning they've had a fairly uneventful life, and they observe a car accident down the street, and it causes such high sustained levels of cortisol that it's hard to understand why that person is more predisposed to that. So the idea about pre and kind of post pubescent kiddos, the, the one true answer I can really give you is the sort of variability of it is always going to increase more around a milestone. So around, you know, adrenarchy, around menarche when someone first gets their period. During the childbearing years, yay. 
postpartum and menopause during these really big milestones, these reproductive milestones, that's when the pulse fertility is going to be much more intense. So I think, you know, when you're thinking about how to manage this stress response in kiddos, I think it's just something you start young, right? It's something that we have to start young because we all have it. And none of us can fully control for our environment. I mean, I might see a mountain lion tomorrow when I'm taking. I don't know. But I might not, right? And the bus might just whiz past me and I don't even think about it. So I think it's it's there are a lot of variables we can't control for. What we can is how we respond to stressors, how we teach our body to be able to re-regulate after an exposure to a stressor that might prompt a surge in cortisol or a surge in adrenaline. It's about being able to re-regulate and kind of bring it back down to a baseline, which is also why I love mindfulness. Because it's really well studied in terms of how powerful and capable deep breathing, very basic things like deep breathing, yoga, and meditation can have on that sort of baseline cortisol response. Thank you. I'm going through the rest of the, let me see, we have a couple came in. What to do with obesity and OCP anxiety depression? Meds was the question. I'm not sure I've. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, obsessive compulsive tendencies in kiddos right now, you know, you're not alone because there are a lot of kiddos that are struggling with this. A lot of my patients are struggling with that kind of anxiety, whether it's, I thought it would be, you know, I thought this year would be met with a lot of social anxiety, maybe some agoraphobia, but what we're seeing is a lot of obsessive and compulsive worries and again how much of it you know chicken egg argument how much of it is vulnerability how much of it is related to just this persistent elevation and stress and worry and i think that the trick is always looking at a kiddo holistically and understanding kind of the hierarchy of treatment targets noticing like okay the beauty of treating depression and anxiety is that one target of treatment might require something totally different than the other one. And it's picking and choosing sort of what is the most detrimental, what is the most important thing to address first, and kind of going from there. I think that keeping in mind, making sure that you have a provider that can think holistically and acknowledge like, hey, you do, your kiddo is going to need some support around their anxiety and depression and the obsessive and compulsive thought patterns and behaviors and we need to be mindful about choosing a medication that's not going to make metabolic concerns worse it's not going to affect their lipid profile it's not going to cause weight gain and i think that's why when you are seeing a new provider whether it's a pediatrician a pcp a gyn or a psychiatrist like really making sure that they're seeing things holistically again the head bones connected to the body bone right you can't separate the two and it's really important to look at all of the systems in conjunction and really understand like yeah, i might treat the anxiety with this but that's going to worsen the depression we'd rather not have to layer in five meds so really striving for a place of what is what is the, the fewest number of interventions that we can reach for with the fewest side effects and i think especially when we're thinking about our kiddos i think that's why i love various aspects of cognitive therapy, exposure response prevention, and really DDT to help cope because those are all side effect free, which I love. And they're not going to worsen someone's metabolic profile. They're not going to cause a risk of disrupting sleep or appetite. Um, but yeah, finding those kind of holistic providers, I think is really essential too. All right, we have one more question and I'm going to read this verbatim. I'm not sure if I'm getting it correctly. How often do you need to withdraw bleed on cops with severe anxiety that appears to be hormonal. Gotcha. Um, how often do the first part again, David? How often do you need to, it's in the chat window if you want to pop it up to read it. How often do you need to withdraw bleed on cops with yes. severe anxiety that appears to be hormonal? Yes. So that kind of goes to what I was saying earlier with the admin. Honestly, I think it depends on the kiddo. It depends on where they're at in terms of growth and, you know, with any intervention, we always, whether it's changing their meals, changing their sleep patterns, on medication, really being mindful of the impact it's having on their overall development, cognitive development, their growth charts, all of that. To be totally, you know, to be totally transparent for me, again, if their symptoms are so detrimental, I think 
few and far between should be the weeks that are so impacted by this. So I would be talking to their provider about how, how, what is the smallest number of weeks a year that we can get away with where we're dealing with this? And how can we really cope ahead, plan around them where the kiddo is not in school, where they maybe have really good therapy support, cope ahead plans, all of that to manage those weeks, but really limiting them. And, and I think, you know, obviously some providers, providers might have varying opinions about like, oh, oh this is where they're at in their growth, but guess what? what? You just monitor and you collect data. And, and I think that there were worries about, you know, know in some, some way affecting a kiddo's growth curve, and then that's a conversation to have. But to be honest, like if someone is every month, half the month struggling with debilitating anxiety, I really would be thinking like at most, maybe they on straight three times a year. I've had kiddos who, again, are past kind of their big growing years, and, you know, obviously it's like maybe once a year, but if a kiddo is still in the thick of kind of growth spurts and what you're kind of hoping to expect out of their growth curve, you have to allow for a little bit more, but again, it's all about data collection, and it's all about just discerning what's going to be the most effective path to take with the least impact. We have one more. Um, I'm gonna. I did provide an answer. I think she should probably be calling us tomorrow. But she said, "I just learned my 13 year old daughter has been cutting herself. I made an appointment with the therapist next week. I'm really concerned. What do you recommend?" Call us tomorrow. Yeah, that, I, yeah, that's. I, I think it's a little bit much for tonight. But I wanted to make sure uh, that we were answering that question and not not. I didn't want you to think that we were ignoring it. Two things. Call us tomorrow so we can figure this out together. And also, you're not alone. If you're so not alone, it's a way of coping with stress. And the trick is finding different ways, more adaptive ways, more effective ways to cope with stress. And there are plenty that can be offered. It's just you have to be identified. But she'll get there, you'll get there. Hopefully we can help you get there. All right. We are almost at the top of the hour. And I think we've answered all the questions that have been submitted. So if there aren't any others, I'm going to uh, close out the session now. So again, thank you all for attending the presentation. As a reminder, a link to the recording it will be sent to you in the next couple of days once we get it posted online. And feel free to share it with anyone you feel may benefit. Dr. Burns, thank you. Participants, thank you. And have a great rest of your evening. Thanks, Thanks all so much. Bye.